The Journal of Agrarian Change has published a special issue on the agrarian political economy of left-wing governments in Latin America. Dr. Leandro Vergara Camus, one of the editors of this special issue, will share more details about it. This special issue is a timely contribution to a larger debate in the region concerning the end of the political cycle of these governments. If I may start by asking you about the motivations behind this endeavor and how it relates to this debate. Yes, uh, well this uh, cycle of left-wing politics sort of uh, starts in the 1990s uh, with several uh, indigenous and peasant movement in Bolivia, Ecuador, in Brazil uh, mobilizing against neoliberal governments, sometimes bringing them down, changing governments, and then uh, by the mid 2000s you have uh, several left-wing politicians and political parties that come to power, and then uh, we have about 10 years of these experience, so we have plenty of time to be able to assess uh, what they've managed to do, what the dynamics has been, uh, what the challenge for social movements been, so the issue uh, looks at uh, several cases, it looks at Argentina, it looks at Bolivia, looks at Ecuador, Brazil, Nicaragua, Paraguay and Venezuela. Our discussion is more geared at agrarian issue, uh, at uh, agricultural policies, but it's still very much in debate with this early debate about the role of the state in social change. The issue gathers contributions covering various countries throughout Latin America. Yet in the concluding paper, you and Cristobal Kay identified eight major trends around the agrarian policies of these governments. If you could now comment on some of these. There are several trends that you can identify as being the major ones. And the first one is that there hasn't been an agrarian reform of a substantial proportion that would have changed the historic uh, unequal distribution of land in Latin America most Latin American countries you have highly unequal distribution of land and though no government really tackled that issue even though Brazil, Bolivia and Venezuela distributed a, a great uh, uh, amount of land during those years Brazil has distributed about 51, 52 million hectares uh, Bolivia has distributed about 18 million hectares and Venezuela about 10 million hectares which is very very impressive, very important but during the same period, agribusiness also increased its coverage as, as managed to continue its expansion. So it has not had the impact. Uh, so you have not challenged the, the, the uh, agribusiness-led model of development. Uh, there are also, there has been some uh, important achievement in terms of increased support for family producer and peasant producer in terms of credits, in terms of infrastructure, uh, a lot of policy have tried to link these uh, producers with the commodity chains that are dominated by uh, agribusiness, for example, in soya. Uh, one thing that really stands out is policies that have uh, improved the working and living condition of rural labor. So you've had a formalization of uh, the labor market, you've had an increase in minimum wage, um, we've also seen all kinds of different types of cash transfer payments that go to the rural poor and all that has contributed to to help uh, improve the uh, living and working condition of the rural poor. As noted in the introduction to the issue, the state often fails to receive enough attention within the field of agrarian studies, so the analysis of its role is clearly another important contribution. What can be said about the role of the state under these governments and in particular in contrast to the neoliberal period of the 1980s and 90s? Um, the state has always been involved in agriculture uh, directly or in, uh, indirectly in Latin America. If you think of, of the main institution that protects private property rights is the state. And the 1990s in Latin America were characterized by a process of privatization of the access to land and the, and the right to land. So the, 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 the neoliberal governments were really involved in trying to um, privatized land and, and the social movement were actually responding to, uh, to that. Uh, but in terms of direct intervention into markets, uh, the state had sort of retreated from uh, directly intervening in the market and the place was taken up by agribusiness. What you have uh, with the, 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 these, these new governments is that the state 
because it was, uh, or, or the left-wing government came to power at the moment of an export boom, a long export boom. Um, they actually managed to uh, take control of more of the revenue of the, uh, uh, and they were able to deploy a little bit more uh, supportive policies for agriculture. And they put more money, though, in uh, agribusiness than in small-scale uh, production. Uh, the state also got involved in uh, very often creating new institutions uh, that did not exist before to directly uh, serve the interest of peasant producers and small-scale producers. But our issue also does not only look at the role of the state, but it also looks at the nature of the state in Latin America. And Cristobal and I think that the nature of the state in Latin America is that it, it, it's a rentier state. It's a state that is able to extract ground rent uh, from uh, capital. And it does that uh, in uh, oil, in gas, but it also does that in agriculture to a certain degree. And the different dominant classes in Latin America use their control of different spaces of the state for their uh, wealth accumulation strategies. And I think that's what has been the major limitation of uh, left wing, uh, the left in general in Latin America has been to not been able to find strategies to deal with that rentier nature. So uh, the dominant classes continue to use the state to uh, block any kind of reform. While there is some variation, the findings also suggest that the interests of peasant and rural movements have not been significantly advanced. Despite these movements, have been a major source of political support for these governments. How can we characterize this contradictory relationship? Yes, that, that is the section that sort of um, uh, speaks directly to the debate that has been going on uh, around food sovereignty. You know, a lot of, of, of uh, uh, movements that fall into the food sovereignty uh, movement or project uh, were calling, uh, have been calling for an intervention state that uh, provides support for small-scale producer and sort of um, uh, puts limit on agribusiness. Uh, and uh, the Food Sovereignty Project also gives social movement more of a role in determining uh, the type of market that uh, should be established in a, in a country, the type of uh, food that should be produced, etc. So a lot of, 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 of uh, uh, analysts that were uh, waiting to see what was going on and what was going to happen with the social movement were trying to see what kind of influence social movement would have on these governments. And um, they actually didn't have the ability to uh, really uh, push the state into more radical policies. And, and, and Cristobal and I think that it has to do with the contradiction that these movements were placed into when they decided to support these political parties or, or these politicians. In some cases, for example in Ecuador, the movements were already in, in a decline when uh, Correa uh, took power. In other places, uh, Bolivia for example, the movement were still very much very strong when Evo Morales uh, took power. But in, 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 in many cases, the, the movement did not have enough power to uh, to pressure these politicians. And because of, again, the nature of the state and, and the relationship between political parties and social movements, it actually is, is the state and political party that ended up uh, dominating, it, if you want, the agenda and, and subordinating social movement to a certain degree. What you have during these governments is that the policies are uh, targeted towards the landed section of the peasantry. And uh, the increased support to link them to agribusiness also sort of starts separating, separating out uh, their own interests with the interests of the rural, of other sectors of the rural poor, landless, landless peasants, uh, rural workers. So uh, the peasant that are landed and that benefit from left-wing policies are much less inclined in supporting more radical um, types of mobilization. So uh, you don't see any more uh, land occupation, for example. Uh, in some cases, you see rural uh, unions supporting agribusiness because their interest in terms of job creation is linked to uh, agribusiness. So that the, the, the policies of left-wing government actually increased peasant differentiation and, and made it more difficult for uh, class unity. 
at the same time, the state with its uh, clientelistic policies also went directly, uh, if you want, uh, establish direct relationship with the grassroots membership of, the, of these movements, cutting the link between uh, leaderships of the movement and their grassroots. So uh, it completely transformed the relationship that existed between grassroots membership, political leaders, and political parties. So to a certain degree, what we argue, Cristobal and I, is that this form of organizing social movement and political party has come to an end with these experiments. Because what we've seen is that movements are not able to pressure the state when they are part of it. Finally, the relationship between these governments and landed elite has also been problematic, as shown by the impeachment process against Lugo in Paraguay and Rousseff in Brazil. What has been the role of Latin American ruling classes and how Marx's concept of quales bourgeoisie can help us to eliminate the discussion? Landed classes in Latin America have always had a privileged access to the state. Um, and this uh, has not changed in the recent decades. So uh, what has changed, though, is that because of the uh, rise of agribusiness and the, 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 the complexification of agriculture, you've had a um, an increase, increased linkages between landed classes, industrial bourgeoisies, and, and finance. Uh, so um, in the 1980s, there were two uh, scholars, uh, uh, Maurice Zetlin and uh, uh, Richard Radcliffe, that uh, looked at uh, the landed, well, the elite in the, the ruling classes in Chile. And they actually saw that there was no separation between uh, landlords and capitalists. And they uh, referred back to the concept, uh, Marx's concept of the coolist uh, bourgeoisie, which is a situation in which there's no distinction between the landed classes and the capitalist class. So we think that under the, uh, within the, the last uh, 30 years, uh, this is what has happened in Latin America in, 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 in general. You, you've seen the interest of the landed classes and in the, in the in industrial classes and, the, and finance becoming way more intertwined than in the past. Uh, so we cannot speak of a landed classes that is separated from a, a, the, 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 the capitalist class. So this creates a situation that it makes it even more difficult to transform a, a society because uh, the dominant classes are, are, are much more intertwined than in the past. That is one of the main conclusions of the special issue.